some useful keyboard shortcuts. The keyboard shortcuts that we have used in class include the U. Let me get up here and I can point at things. Is it, you said this is on Canvas? Not yet, okay. but the one from last semester is, which is shorter and doesn't have as many slides. Okay. So, keyboard shortcuts in the timeline. U reveals all the keyframes that have been created for the current layer, if you have one selected, or if no layer is selected, it will reveal all the keyframes for the current comp. If you press AA really quickly, you get the materials options for a 3D layer, and that includes if you have lights, it'll bring up the lighting options. If you have a camera, it brings up the camera options. If you press LL when you have the audio waveform selected, or the audio layer selected, it will re reveal the waveform for that sound layer so you can see where all the peaks and valleys are. No matter <laughs> what tool you have, if you press selection, or press the V, you get the selection tool. If you press P, it will reveal the position transforms for the current layer or for all layers if you have no layer selected. Same thing for T, reveals opacity. Opacity, isn't that cute? We use the T. Um, and you can see what the opacity transforms are for the current layer or all layers if none are selected. R reveals rotation transforms for the current layer. S reveals scale transforms for the current layer. So these are all buttons that we've been using. And they're really helpful when you have a lot of layers of stuff and you've done a lot of stuff to a layer. If you, if you want to just see which things have keyframes, just press the U. If you want to work on a specific type of transform for a layer and you've got, say you've put on all kinds of different transforms, you have opacity, you have the rotation, you have the scale, you have the position, and you, you want to, also, and also perhaps you have some animators that you've been using on a text layer and you just want to move it from left to right because it's in the wrong place. You can just push P and then that's the only layer that comes up. Otherwise you end up with this huge group of things that you have to look at if you just use the arrow to fly it down. So these are the great, great useful shortcuts. And then for everything in the world, if you press Command Z, it undoes the last action. If you press Command A, it selects all, and if you press Command S, it saves your file. So those are the keyboard shortcuts that we've been using all semester, and I'm sure you've used a lot of the universal ones in other classes as well for all kinds of programs, right? So these are the things that are the most important to remember. So light types, remember we've used at least we've used the ambient and the spot. I showed you the parallel and I've showed some of you the point light. So the ambient light has no apparent direction or source. It doesn't cast shadows. It just fills the whole area with a consistent level of illumination. So everything's just about the same lightness. Okay? And that, that makes it it's a fill light basically so that it doesn't, you don't end up with a bunch of shadows from different spotlights. You just want to have a fill light to make the whole area light and not have a big black area. A spotlight, however, has a specific source and direction, so it starts in one point, and then it has a cone shape, so it gets wider as it gets farther away from you. It can have a softer or sharp edge, so you can just adjust whether it's going to be a sharp <coughs> edge or a soft edge. If an object goes before the light it will, or behind the light, it will be dark because you are behind the light. The light is at negative 444, and you are at an infinite distance from whatever's going on. So you make things go behind the light, and they just go black. You can still see where they are, but they're black, and they're not casting shadows anymore. So when you have spotlights and you don't have an ambient fill light, and you have something that goes behind the spotlight, it just goes completely black. A point light is like an incandescent light bulb. It has a position, and the light is emitted outward in a complete circle, okay? It casts shadows. It's like a spotlight, in fact, that it casts shadows, and the rays are coming out at an angle, so the shadows get bigger as they go further away from the object. But it also casts it all over. This light is going in all directions. A parallel light 
cast shadows in straight parallel lines all the same distance apart is like the sun, which is so far away that all the light rays travel in a straight line and don't spread out apparently to us. So that's what a parallel light is like. Three D space. How many people here like geometry? That's <laughs> one of my passions. Yeah. So, have you heard of Rene Descartes? The guy that did geometry. He's a famous mathematician, um, and he invented the coordinate system that we are using for 3D space. So the Cartesian coordinate system, which refers to X, Y, and Z graph. And this is what we use in 3D space. So Wikipedia goes into a long, drawn-out description. If a diagram, a 3D projection, or 2D pr perspective drawing shows the x and y axis horizontally and vertically respectively, then the z axis should be shown pointing out of the page towards the viewer or camera. In such a 2D diagram of a 3D coordinate system, the z axis would appear as a line or ray pointing down and to the left or down to the right, depending on the presumed viewer or camera perspective. So, in the 3D world of After Effects, the z axis is oriented away from the viewer and therefore a negative z number will bring an object closer to the viewer and a positive number will be further away from the viewer. So basically what they're saying is that in normal 3D space, it would have the opposite scale than we do. So instead of, instead of being negative numbers towards us, they're saying they'd be positive numbers towards us. So it's important to realize this if you have any understanding of geometry and you really, really liked it, that it's actually the opposite. But if you don't, yeah, just don't even worry about it. Do you need to know the, the guy's name that came up with? No. This, no. no. Okay, to make it easier, I started breaking it down. So these are the newer slides. This is to describe 3D space related to what you've been doing so you understand it and so you can make some connections in your head. So. 3D space, X, Y, and Z coordinates, and it's hard to see on this slide, but I describe it down here. But this is a red arrow that's coming towards us. This is from the side, and the red arrow is pointing out like that. The blue arrow is here. The green arrow is there, up. So the x-axis points to the left and right. The middle of the screen is at 640 on the ruler counted in pixels because 0 is over here, 640 is in the middle, and 1280 is over there because that's the size we're using, right? 1280 wide. So 0, 640, 1280. The y-axis points up and down, and the middle of the screen is at 360 on the ruler. So, but the thing is, you should be aware that 0 is at the top, and 640 is at the bottom in After Effects. So that's what you have to know about why. And then Z points away from the viewer. The center of the screen is at zero. Negative numbers are closer to the viewer, so they're coming this way. And positive numbers are further away, going that way. Makes more sense than the last one, doesn't it? And to make it even easier, I go ahead and describe it a little bit more. So the x-axis, the red arrow axis, is the horizontal axis. Numbers in the ruler start at the left at 0 and move to 1280 at the right. The y-axis, the green arrow axis, is the vertical axis. Numbers start at the top at 0 and move to 720 at the bottom. The z-axis, which is the blue arrow axis, is the depth in space axis. Numbers start at zero in the mid plane of the screen, grow positively as you move away from the viewer, and negatively as you grow, move toward the viewer, okay? Trying to make it easy to understand, because a lot of the stuff that they have written on the web in Wikipedia gets a little bit technical.
Okay, does that make sense? Yes. Okay, good. The x-axis, when you're talking about position transforms, here's position, the x-axis is the red arrow axis. Use this coordinate to move objects to the either side of the stage, and that's this first coordinate, which is 640 because it's right in the middle right now. So this is the default placement, 640. Okay. The y-axis, the green arrow axis, that's that one. Use this coordinate to move things up and down on the stage. Zero at the top, 720 at the bottom, or 1280, 720. 720 at the bottom. Okay, 720 at the bottom. So this is actually at the bottom. And then the middle, oh, there you go, okay, the top one. Here's the arrow. 360, so this is the middle, right there. Okay, and then the last one, the blue arrow axis, and here you see, it goes back. So it gets larger as it goes back. Use this arrow to move objects in front of or, of or behind other objects or to position the lights or cameras to best show your composition, okay? So this is important to remember. That's why I did several slides, because I want to make sure that you see it in different ways and understand it in whatever way works best for you. Because every person needs to have it described a different way to really make them understand it. And at least this is a start. Now for rotations. Rotations in X, Y, and Z, once again, they're a little bit complicated, so I tried to describe them here. The rotation of 90 degrees around the X axis will allow you to lay a flat plane down like a floor or a ceiling. And using the position on the Y, you can move it up or down. The rotation of 90 degrees, 90 degrees around the Y axis will allow you to create a wall on, in the middle of the stage and using X you can move it left or right, okay? And then rotation around the Z axis will make a plane spin around the center of the comp like a pinwheel. If you combine the rotations to affect the outcome, in, it's difficult to describe, so try to use just one axis of rotation when possible. You use the orientation transform to set the original position of an object in space, but do not keyframe orientation. Some people might keyframe orientation if they're really wonderful masters at this and understand what's happening, but it will just confuse you, so don't. <laughs>
for a layer positioned in Z space behind another 3D layer casting a shadow. But there has to be a light or no shadows will happen. Text animators. Text animators can be very fun. And in X, Y, and Z, they can be even more fun. Per character 3D allows the transformation of individual letters in X, Y, and Z space. So there's the link to how you animate text for Adobe. Text animators will animate the position, the rotation, opacity, and other transforms. They are the basis of the typewriter effect and other text animation presets. They can be saved as your own animation presets. And text animators also allow you to use wiggle, bloat, and other properties and effects. So, and you've all used the text animators. So you, you're pretty aware of what that is. So. If you see a question about text animators, you should be able to handle that just artfully. Cameras. I'm not going to ask a lot of questions about camera settings and camera le focal length and stuff, but I will probably ask one or two. So you want to know that the 50 millimeter lens is the normal one that you use most for everything. It looks, looks normal. It doesn't look distorted. But a 35 millimeter lens is a wide angle lens, and a 135 millimeter is a common telephoto lens. Telephoto lenses will sort of, they counteract perspective, so things look like they're all in the same space. Wide angle accentuates the perspective, so things look like they're further away than they are. That's, it's all, if you, if you change the focal length, it's going to change the way it looks. So, enable depth of field, I'm not sure exactly what that does, but the focal length, when you change the focal length, it just changes the way things look. The default camera, if you're not using a camera, is going to be just your regular 50 millimeter. So, now, when we were using the camera orbit null, like I say, you don't want to move your camera around, really. You don't want to keyframe your camera. You want to keyframe an orbit null, which you can use for changing the position as well. It's parented so that the, the camera layer has the orbit null listed as the parent. And you can see that here. It says null one. Camera one, null one. So any move that you put on this is going to appear as the camera move. The camera doesn't have any changes in here. But the Y rotation for the null <laughs> is 60 degrees. This still says zero, but the view shows that the camera is looking at it with 60 degrees rotation. So, and when it, when it does, it's, it's using it as an orbit pan. So, because if you rotate the camera itself, it's going to rotate like this. But you would want to use the, um, well, you'd, you'd want to use the point of view. You'd want to move something else instead of moving the camera that way. And you want to use the orbit null. You don't want to. You don't want to change the settings for the camera itself, usually. You want to maybe set the camera up in one place, but if you're going to move it around, you're going to use an orbit null to do the actual keyframing. It's just a lot easier to work with. Keyframe types. The linear keyframe is the one that by default appears when you make a keyframe. A hold keyframe is the one where it has as the, the object gets the information from the keyframe, it just stays there and it doesn't interpolate on either side. When another keyframe shows up with more information about position, it just suddenly shows up wherever that one is. It's, it jumps. A roving keyframe will keep 
the spacing between keyframes proportional. So the first keyframe and the last keyframe in a group of keyframes cannot be roving, only the ones between them. And uh, easy ease have Bezier handles, let you adjust the rate of change as the object nears the keyframe. And easy ease in and easy ease out are the ones that we've been generally using. You easy ease into the station, you easy ease out of the station. So you, you start out going quickly and then slow down as you easy ease in. And you start out at a stop and then speed up as you easy ease out. So that's your keyframe interpolation. When you change to the ray traced renderer from the classic 3D renderer, this is the warning dialog box that comes up. And this is what it tells you. You have extruded and beveled text and shapes, reflections and refraction, environment layers and curved footage, but it will not render blending modes, track mats, layer styles, masks and effects on continuously rasterized layers, including text and shape layers. So you can have mask and effects on some raster, just regular raster layers, but not on the ones that it's using as vector. Masks and effects on 3D pre-composition layers with collapsed transformations and preserve underlying transparency. So try things, see if they work, but most likely they won't. <laughs> but uh, it warns you about that every time you sign on. So we could probably click that button if we wanted to. Just be aware that ray tracing takes so much memory that they decided to focus the memory on the things that it could do and not put on any extras like that. Compression and codecs. This reduces the size of your file by keeping track of information but not saving each pixel or bit of information separately as the program normally would. So it, it makes up this, it makes up a sort of a, a stand-in and, and some types of compression are lossless, so it just says these three things are the same, so we'll save them in one place, but then we'll unpack it when we decompress it, and they'll be exactly the same. But the kind of compression we usually use with video is lossy, which means that it takes things that are just about nearly the same, and it just says, okay, we'll just make them all the same. It, it drops out colors, and it, it doesn't have as tight resolution as the original generally. But since video uses so much memory, compression is about the only thing we can do, unless you're going to save it non-compressed, which case it will take up so much space that you probably wouldn't be able to save it on a drive. You'd have to have a special drive to do that. A codec, that is the term that means code or decode or compression decompression. The video codec or type of compression that we've been using to compress the video output is H.264. So that's the one we've been choosing. And the audio codec we are using for output to 3D rendering is AAC. So remember that. You should be able to recognize those when we have questions. Camera moves. So a POV shot is a scene from the point of view of a character. The character in this case is that grasshopper. Well, actually, it's the viewer behind the grasshopper, but this is to give you an idea of what it means. Wide angle, a large overall view of the scene, which is an establishing shot to orient the viewer. There can be characters in it, but they're not generally recognizable because they're so small. So here we've got this sandy beach with people standing there. A close-up is an area of detail within a larger picture. So it's usually close-ups of people. When you zoom in or zoom out, you have a continual 
advance or retreat of the camera to the subject, and a pan is when you horizontal, vertical, or diagonal scan of the subject by rotating the camera. So these are the things you should remember. You remember this is a frame. So when you have film, you have separate frames that you can see. And even though videotape doesn't have separate frames that you can see on the tape itself, the information is saved as separate frames. So the idea is that you're using the, the way that we see things, that we see things with the uh, persistence of vision. So persistence of vision allows us to see things as a, com a continual motion when they're actually just very quick changes of single frames because that's the way your eye perceives. It holds on to an image for just a moment and then goes on to the next m image. So that's your single frame. Keyframe, a frame showing an important change in position or appearance used as a guide for subsequent action used in storyboards to tell the story, showing the beginning or end of a move. A storyboard, a visual outline of an animation or a movie using keyframes to describe the action, with notes about dialogue, camera moves, and editing, binary digit bit, the smallest piece of information, two possible states on or off, zero or one, a byte is eight bits of information, then the additive and subtractive color system. This is video. This is print. RGB color is the additive color system model. It's used in film, video, and web. Light is emitted from the source. A wider gamut of color is available. CMYK, subtractive color system model used for print. Ink on a surface, surface will absorb the light. That's why it's called subtractive. Don't use CMYK color in a video. Don't try to import a CMYK color, CMYK color image into an After Effects file. It doesn't work right. It's not meant to be used that way. Make sure. Many a time I've had people say, this isn't working. It's because they're trying to bring in a CMYK. It doesn't work. A pixel is a portmanteau. Joel said, what is a portmanteau? It's like a suitcase. So it's a compound word. I'll replace that. It's a compound word because people don't understand what portmanteau means. Made from the words picture element, it refers to a dot of light on screen that makes up the picture. Do you know why I know the word portmanteau? Do you know why I know that term? Because I really like Lewis Carroll. Lewis Carroll used that. <sighs> OK, so the quiz has 25 questions. There are multiple choices based on the information in this review session. You will also complete an in-class project using the provided files and information. Be prepared to hand in your project for animation and tutorials if you have not already done so. OK, so you can hand them in today, or you can hand them in at the, mid at the final. You need to turn in the 3D text, 3D lighting, 3D camera, per character 3D, 3D ray tracing, and then your, your actual animated 3D identical project. Please be ready to do that. OK, any questions? Can we handle it? Mm -hmm. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs>